Hi everyone, and welcome to this Godot tutorial where we're going to talk about some advanced features of 2D tile maps. Okay, so in this video, we're going to build on the fundamentals of Godot 2D tile maps that we saw in this previous episode of the series and discuss some more powerful features of tile maps in Godot 4. More precisely, we're going to see how we can use patterns and terrains to create 2D levels more quickly, how we can set up isometric tile maps to get pseudo 3D rendering, and even how to create animated tile maps. Of course, as usual, don't forget that if you want to get the files of this tutorial directly, you can have a look at the GitHub repo with all my Godot tutorials over here. And with that said, let's dive in and explore some advanced features of Godot's 2D tile maps. Okay, so in the previous episode on tile maps, we discussed how to use the basic tile map tools to quickly paint single tiles, or a line, or a rectangle, or even an entire area. But did you know that there are actually some little tricks to making our 2D levels even faster? For example, if you know you're gonna have little chunks of tiles that will be repeated in various places in your tile maps, then you may want to use the tile map patterns feature. Basically, those patterns are a way to store packs of tiles, assembled in a specific way, and then get a higher level palette of tile packs that you can place again instantly. Typically, let's say you have this simple 2D tile map, with little platforms like this. By the way, as in the previous tutorial, this tile set was made by Kenny, and it's part of his amazing free library of CC0 resources, so be sure to check it out. Okay, now you see here that all platforms, some are with two tiles, others are with three tiles, but in any case, to paint one, we need to select and paint multiple types of tiles to create a single platform. So if we wanted to repeat these platforms many times, we could actually make a pattern out of them. To do this, we just need to go to the tile map editor, and at the top, switch to the patterns tab. Then we just pick the SELECT tool, select the group of tiles that we want to memorize, and drag it to the patterns area at the bottom. You see that we now have our two or three block platforms available in this little library of patterns, and if we select one and use the paint tool, then we can directly place a new platform with a single click. And of course, you can also do this with even more advanced packs of tiles, and therefore significantly reduce the number of tile switching that is required. Now, the issue with patterns is that they can only store a very specific assembly of tiles, so if you need variations, you'll need to create a lot of patterns, and eventually you'll sort of end up with the same problem as before, since you'll need to constantly pick another pattern in the list to place your level chunks. That's why Godot 4 style maps offer an even more powerful tool, the terrains. Those are the direct continuation of Godot 3's auto-tiling, except that they're a bit more advanced and handle more edge cases than this previous feature. So the idea is that for some or even all of your tiles in the tileset, you'll define what connections they are allowed to have with other tiles. And this way, by telling Godot precisely what juxtapositions can or can't happen, you're giving it the usage rules of your tileset. Actually, this is kind of what we, as humans, do spontaneously. If I show you those two tiles and I ask you to put them next to one another, you'll probably rather go for this combination than for this one. And similarly, if I show you all of those nine tiles, you'll probably guess quite quickly that this tile is meant to be in the middle, and those are the borders and the corners. So to allow Godot to think like us and understand these continuity rules, we need to define them clearly using terrains. And because it's data at the tile level, this time it's not done in the tile map, but in the reference tileset resource itself. For example, here, let's continue with our tileset by Kenny and use the terrains for it. Now, to create a new terrain in our tileset, we need to go to its inspector and open the terrains section. Then we have to create a new terrain set by clicking the add element button and inside this new data resource, create a terrain. 
And now we can also rename our terrain to something more meaningful, like red, for example, because for now we'll only be taking into account the red tiles in the tileset. And we can also change its color so that it's a bit easier to see in the editor later on. Okay, now we need to go to the tileset editor and in the middle panel switch to the paint tab. You might remember from the first episode that this is where we painted our collisions. In truth, this is where you can paint all the per tile metadata for your tileset, be it basic notions like collisions, more advanced things like navigation through the use of terrains, or even completely custom user data that you want to access in your scripts at runtime. Here, let's just pick the Terrain Paint tool, and below, pick our Terrain Set and our Terrain Data object. You see that now, if I click on one of the red tiles in the tileset view on the right, and then I hover this zone, there are little spots that get highlighted. Basically, these highlights show which neighboring cells should be filled or empty in the actual time up instance for this specific tile to be allowed to appear when using terrains. And for now, those spots are pretty precise. There is one in the middle, one on each side, and one in every corner. That's because by default, a terrain set uses the match corners and sides mode. However, you'll notice that this dropdown actually offers three possibilities. The match corners and sides mode, the match sides mode, and the match corners mode. So this mode determine how your rules are defined, and more precisely, what type of neighboring they depend on. With the default mode, the match corners and sides, your rules will look at the presence or the absence of neighboring tiles with the same terrain in each of the eight possible directions. So top left, top, top right, right, bottom right, bottom, bottom left, and left. But if we switch to the match corners mode, then the rules will only consider the neighbor tiles in the four corners. And with the match sides mode, they will only consider the neighbor tiles in the four adjacent cells in a straight line. For this tile set, we can keep the default mode, so match corners and sides, and just set the rules for various tiles by clicking on the different little highlights. If you want to require the presence of a neighbor tile with the same terrain, then you have to click on the highlight and you see it gets colored with the color of our terrain. And if you want to remove it, you just right click on it, and then this tile will only appear if there is no adjacent tile with the same terrain in this direction. No, truth be told, it can require a bit of practice and some trial and error to get everything right. But here, for example, this setup should be okay for the red tiles of the tileset. Now, if we come back to our tile map node and its editor at the bottom, we can go to the Terrains tab and select our new red terrain. And then, as soon as we paint just a few tiles, you see that Kodo auto switches their type to make something consistent with the rules that we gave it. Now, you'll see that there might be some cells where the rules are not enough for Godo to properly decide, and so you might need to do a second manual pass to fix those little spots and issues. But overall, this is a new and very quick and powerful way of creating fairly big chunks of 2D levels while making sure that they make sense visually. By the way, a nice thing is that a tile can also belong to several terrains or terrain sets, and Godot will be able to mix them properly when you paint. Alright, so we've discussed two new tools for creating our time maps faster. Now to continue this in-depth exploration of the feature, it's time to dive into another really neat option, which is setting up and using non-square time maps. So sometimes you don't want to make square tile sets for side scrollers or top down to the worlds. Instead, you might want to use a hexagonal grid or even create a pseudo 3D render with isometric tiles. And so in that case, you can't use Godot's default tileset mode anymore. Here, let's have a look at how to set up isometric tiles. And to study this, we're going to use this nice sprite sheet by Artyom Sagorski, which you can get on itch.io for free, and which here I've severely reduced to just four blocks, even though there are actually way more variations in the original tileset. 
Okay, now after we've created our new tileset resource and dragged in the reference tilesheet image, we can start by changing the tile shape of our tileset resource to isometric. Now, of course, we then need to readjust the specific parameters of the tileset to match our tilesheet, so let's have a look at all of this. Now, the tile layout and tile offset axis are pretty common properties for isometric tilesets in game engines. There are various ways of stacking and ordering the tiles on the grid when drawing the tile map, and you might need to change those in some particular cases, but honestly, most of the time, those default settings are okay. For real, the trick with isometric tileset is to find the proper size for the tiles, cause this time it's not that easy to just match the tiles in the preview of the tileset editor. To get the proper perspective, usually it's better to actually prepare our tile map node, have it use our tileset resource, and add a few tiles inside. Now you see that for now, of course, it's completely out of sync. We don't have any feeling or 3D or perspective. To fix this, we need to find the right tile size. And you can actually tweak this property in our tileset resource until we get something that looks nice. Note that here there's not always just one right solution. With some tile sheets, you might have some liberties in how you stack the tiles next to each other and how you want them to sort of block one another. And so now you see that we have this sort of pseudo 3D render with the perspective illusion. It looks like those cubes could actually be just 3D objects rendered with an orthographic camera. And guess what? Something really nice is that the concepts that we saw in the first section about patterns and terrains can also apply in that case. Typically here, we could set up a basic terrain system in a match site mode, set up the terrain data, and then draw our isometric time map directly. So as you can see, making non-square tile maps in Godot requires a bit of experience, but it's actually not that difficult. And that's not all. To go further in our exploration of 2D tile maps, let's discuss one last cool feature, which is creating animated tile sets. Although tile maps are usually used for environments, level shapes and backgrounds, this doesn't mean that they can't move. In Godot, you can pretty easily embed animations inside your tile sets using a frame-by-frame -frame animation method. And to see that, we're going to work on these basic tile sets that I made myself in the style of Ganny's artwork, and that is available on my GitHub, like all the rest of the resources for this tutorial. Now, at first glance, you might think that this tile set contains 16 tiles. But what if, instead, you considered those two lines like frame-by-frame -frame sprites for a little water wave animation. Then you could actually make something like this, where the ground and grass tiles are just simple tiles as usual, but the water tiles in the middle are directly animated. To do this, the idea is the following. For the normal tiles, we'll simply click on them in the grid with the right settings for tile set to add them to the tile set resource, like we saw in the previous episode. But for the animated tiles, we'll just click on the first one in the row, and then jump into the Select tab in the middle to select and edit this new tile. You see that in the options, we have a section about animation, and in particular, at the top, we get an input to specify the number of columns of our tile animation. So this is basically the number of frames that we want to use in our animation, and as you can see, Godot expects those frames to be side by side on the same row. Typically here, let's say that we have four columns, four or four water frames on this row. Then we can simply go to the frames subsection and click on add element to add new frames to this anim. You'll notice that they gradually highlight to the right, so we'll do this three times to highlight all of our sprites on this row. Now you also see that if you try to hover them, you can't actually select them, cause they are not real standalone tile types, they're just a sort of variant of the real initial water wave tile all the way on the left of the row. Then we can of course do the same with the third row in the tile set, and this way we now have two water wave animations that are complementary. So if we create a tile map node that uses our tile set, and place a few tiles, 
then you see that we get the normal simple tiles that are static, and then as soon as we place water wave tiles, they start to move according to our frame by frame animation. If you want to change the speed of this animation, you can go back to the tileset editor and where we set up our animation frames, change the speed parameter. For an even finer control of the frame length, you can also change the length of each individual frame to get a non-linear animation. And also the really cool thing is that because you specify the number of columns that you want in your animation, you can even have multiple animated frames per row. For example, the very last row of the tilesheet contains two animations that each contain two frames. So we could create both all start frames and then animate them using two columns for each. And here we are. We now have a very basic animated tile map that auto runs in the editor while we're painting and will continuously loop this animation for as long as we're playing the scene. By the way, before finishing this tutorial, I do want to point out that with the new release of Godot 4.2, which is currently in alpha but might soon become the new standard, there are various optimizations and boosts that have been added for tile maps, so you might want to check out the release notes. Most notably, we'll now be able to flip or rotate tiles and patterns directly when we edit our tile map which is pretty cool for creating ever more variations. Though, keep in mind that this version also comes with a few breaking changes, so you should be careful before upgrading your project. But anyway, here you go. You now know how to take advantage of Godot's advanced Talma features and how to create your 2D levels even faster. So I hope you liked this tutorial and that it helped you learn even more things about this really cool tool. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like it and subscribe to the channel to not miss the next ones. And of course, don't hesitate to drop a comment with ideas of good tricks that you'd like to learn. As always, thanks a lot for watching and take care.